Hi, everyone. My name is Roberto Bosch, and I'm the president of the LGBTQ Canes Affinity Group and the America's Chair of Lighthouse, an employee and a diversity and inclusion group at Aberdeen Center Investments. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Aberdeen Center Investments, Lighthouse, and Unity Employee Resource Groups, as well as the University of Miami. We are thrilled to have Aberdeen staff, students, and alumni, and friends from BU, all from all over the country, joining us. I'm very excited to hear from our esteemed panel. Now, before I think, turn things over to the speakers for the afternoon, I'd like to share a few logistics with you to ensure that everyone gets the most out of their time together. The chat feature is going to be disabled for the duration of the program. However, we're gonna have some interactive trivia to test your knowledge today. And should you have any questions, um, please submit those via the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. And we'll be, we'll be doing our best to get through as many questions as possible. And we're so excited to have many of you joining us today. But first, let me introduce uh, Kevin Lyons, a senior investment manager at, in the Alternative Investment Strategies team and part of Unity, one of Aberdeen Center Investments Diversity and Inclusion Groups. Thanks, Roberto. I appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kevin Lyons, and I'm a member of Unity, one of four employee networks at ASI. The goals of the employee networks are to provide a safe place for employees to come together to plan ways in which we can make our culture more inclusive, especially for underrepresented groups of people. As a member of our multicultural network, I've come to appreciate the experiences of others in the workplace. And as a manager, have been able to provide a perspective of what we can do to bring about impactful change that would increase awareness and diversity. Growing awareness of the gender pay gap, Black Lives Matter movement, widening economic inequality, and the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 have all brought increased attention on the structural discrimination facing vulnerable or marginalized groups, including women, BIPOC, people with disabilities, and the LGBTQ community. We believe companies that embed diversity and inclusion standards are better placed to attract talent, get the most from their workforce, and meet the needs of their customers. And it is critical for the long-term sustainability of companies and economic growth. Today, I have the honor to introduce two very esteemed panelists, Dr. Vega and Nick Harris. First, Dr. Vega holds a doctorate in higher education leadership from Florida International University, a master's in education instructional leadership and obtained her undergraduate degrees from the University of Illinois at Chicago. With almost 29 years of experience, she has worked at renowned universities, including the University of Illinois at Chicago and Northeastern in Boston, Florida International University, and currently serves as the LGBTQ Student Center Director at the University of Miami. Her passion and work in the LGBTQ community date back to the early 90s when she was working with students at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where she established the first of its kind LGBT mentoring program in higher education. She has been awarded the prestigious Eddie McIntyre Community Service Award, Aqua Foundation for Women's Leadership Award, and has also presented at international conferences, workshops, and is passionate about diversity, education, social justice, and addressing issues of access and choice in higher education. Nick Harris is a queer gender non-conforming attorney, attorney, activist, and speaker. She obtained her undergraduate degree from Florida A&M University and law degree from Florida State University. Nick is vice chair of the Human Rights Campaign National Board of Governors. She serves on the board of Ruth's List Broward and Ignite Women's Services, is vice president of the Dolphin Democrats, the Florida LGBTQ Democratic Caucus, and is a big in the Big Brothers Big Sisters Pride program. In 2014, she helped found Thou Art Women, a signature open mic event celebrating LGB, LGBTQ women and their allies. In 2019, she was appointed the LGBTQ Consumer Advocate to Agriculture and Consumer Services Commissioner Nikki Freed. This is the first person of its kind to be a member of the Florida Cabinet. Nick is an award-winning Toastmaster and speaks across the country in support of equality. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Vega and Nick Harris today. Thank you, Kevin and Roberto. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Gisela Ponce Vega, also known as Dr. V. I use she, her, 
they, them pronouns, and I'm delighted to be with you here today with my good friend, Nick Harris. So prior to arriving to the U, I was busy at FIU creating their LGBT initiatives program. While I was there, I was also fortunate to be an adjunct faculty member in their Women and Gender Studies program, teaching LGBTQ history and the LGBT and beyond non-normative sexuality in a global perspective course. Definitely one of my most favorite things um, that I got to do, and you'll get to learn a little bit more about that in a bit. But before we start today's uh, webinar, I wanted to tell you all about a special day today, Spirit Day. That's why you'll see many of us dressed in purple today. Spirit Day is an annual LGBTQ Awareness Day observed on the third Thursday in October. Started in 2010, it was initially created in response to a rash of widely publicized bullying-related suicides of gay students in 2010, including that of Tyler Clemente. LGBTQ youth disproportionately face bullying and harassment because of their identities. Each year, millions go purple for Spirit Day to support their identity. Millions of people are standing up for bullying today. So I'm encouraging you to get out your purple and remember to visit glad, G-L-A-A-D dot org slash Spirit Day to take the pledge against bullying today. So for those of you that may not know, October is LGBT History Month as well as Hispanic Heritage Month. And in the United Kingdom, it is Black History Month. So today's program is about sharing his, hers, and our stories of our Black, Brown, and Latinx LGBTQ heroes and sheroes. This is an annual month-long observance of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender history. It was founded in 1994 by a high school teacher um, and it helps the month provides role models, builds communities, highlights the history of the gay and civil rights movements, and it shares the contributions of the LGBTQ plus community. The months are currently celebrated in Hungary, United States, United Kingdom, Canada, Brazil, and several other countries. Now, most of us, I know I did, never heard about LGBT history, um, or even knew that there were curriculums that existed on our college and university campuses today that explore, explore gender and sexuality. Actually, gender and sexuality programs and curriculums are still relatively new in education, probably about 50 to 60 years old. There are around 600 programs across the country in colleges and universities. These programs origins are in lesbian and gay studies and feminist theory. Actually, the U has a wonderful gender and sexuality studies program that offers a minor in LGBTQ studies. So now on to the fun part of today's webinar. Nick and I are gonna start out by introducing some trivia questions to make this interactive with you all. The questions will highlight the stories of those incredible queer pioneers who paved the way in history, often times in the shadows. So after our trivia question, We'll be sure and save some time for you if you have questions. Remember to place your question in the, in the question, uh, Q&A box. So now let's get started with our first question. So a large migration of Southern Blacks at the start of the 20th century turned this place into one of the most popular African-American communities in the United States. From the 20s to the 30s, this community became a literary and artistic hotspot that produced an outpouring of celebrated works by Black artists, musicians, singers, and writers. This era was full of innovative ideas, social changes, and artistic outlets that showcased the talents of Black people and where LGBTQ Black artists flourish. Which one was it? We have Greenwich Village, Harlem Renaissance, the Left Bank, Paris, Bohemia, and the city of Atlanta. So go ahead and answer your, see if you know which one it is. Let's check out your Je LGBT history. We need some Jeopardy music. <laughs> yes, we do. Mm -hmm.
poll results are up. Awesome. All right. So what do we see, Nick? Uh, it looks like Harlem Renaissance. We got a. We got a. These were some great guesses, but uh, they guessed correctly. The majority. Ooh. Yay! Great job. So let me let me share with you as we put these questions together. Each of these communities has a significant uh, meaning for our LGBTQ communities. So hopefully you'll all get a chance to go back in your history and check some of those out. But this one uh, in particular, the Harlem Renaissance. Throughout history, we know that this has been really a place where many of our LGBTQ of color um, felt safe and were able to express themselves. Um, so one of the things we want to do is see kind of what parallels do we see between um, our historical piece in terms of our, our queer artists uh, and these communities and today. So I'm going to turn it over to Nick to share some of your um, um, well, thank you, Dr. Vega. This is a great question. Um, it, it does make me think about, first of all, you guys did a great job. Um, and that was a great welcome, Roberto. I, I was going to say, I think every generation has its influencers, right? I mean, we definitely want to highlight the Harlem Renaissance. It was a beautiful time. Um, but I also I can't help but think about my parents' generation in Motown. Like I, I, I grew up listening and going to take their little records and thinking about what a pivotal uh, part music and Motown played in the civil rights movement and what we saw. But even going further and thinking about, you know, nobody's, well, I don't want to say nobody because Mo, Motown is still alive and well and, and you hear it. But even thinking about artists today, uh, I don't I don't know if you all watch sports, but I can't help but think about Beyonce, right? During the Super Bowl when formation happened and you literally had um, police departments refusing to provide security to Beyonce because they were so deeply offended uh, places by such a grand showing of uh, blackness, of loving blackness, of loving who you are. Uh, that, that made me think about that. I even think about Megan Thee Stallion. And it's crazy, I don't, you may not believe this. Google Megan Thee Stallion whenever we're done and look up uh, Megan's New York Times article where she talks about why she has become so outspoken around um, women's issues and movements and really has taken a lot of interest like so many people in, in Breonna Taylor's case. So you just keep seeing how each generation, Chance the Rapper and so many other folks who are really holding that torch today, like music plays such a role, I think at all times. And and, and Dr. Vega, if you won't mind, I, I, I would love to go back to up to the first part of that when we talk about sort of these um, safe communities you know, in my bio, you heard them from Tallahassee. I mean, don't get me wrong, Tallahassee's like a blue dot in a sea of red. But um, my partner and I, I can't tell you that I necessarily feel super safe when I drive out of South Florida, uh, holding hands with my partner necessarily. Yet that was a big deal about why I moved to South Florida is I had heard about, this may sound crazy because you probably knew it, but I was like, there's a gay city in Florida? You know, it was Wilton Manors that was like, this can't be real. Um, you know, Wilton Manors isn't a perfect place. I literally live two blocks from Wilton Manors. Um, but it's a safe place and where, you know, I, my partner and I feel very safe uh, walking down the street, holding hands. And so even now in, in currently where we are, we see that we still have to have safe havens. Absolutely, absolutely. And that migration piece is so critical um, to our community as a whole. Actually, I, I want to share with you a little bit about the left bank, Paris, Bohemia. Um, a actually, Paris became a safe haven for a lot of expats, especially our black and brown LGBT folk who found freedom there, who weren't being um, discriminated against in the same way, weren't experiencing racism as they were here in the States then, who fled to um, Paris and sought out that, that area. Um, you know, Paris with its, with its openness being a place where people could live and express themselves free, as freely and as openly as they wanted to. We see that with a lot of cities that our LGBT people migrated to was this feeling of safeness and security. So thank you for that. We're going to go on to the next question. Thanks, Nick. My pleasure. 
So the second question is, says Black Lives Matter is a globally led movement that started in the United States. It advocates for nonviolent civil disobedience and protest against incidences of police brutality and all racially motivated violence against black people. The movement advocates against police violence towards black people as well as various other policy changes considered to be related to black liberation. From the start, the Black Lives Matter movement has been about LGBTQ people. Two of its co-founders identify as queer women of color. Who are they? All right, let's see how folks do on this one. Get our poll up there. Yeah, Nick, you're absolutely right. We need a little bit of... There, oh, there it is. Yes. <laughs> Y'all are good. Producers are good. Panelists, I am Nick Trebek, and we'd like to see your answers now. <laughs> oh, wow, this one's interesting. Okay, so folks were pretty sure of themselves with Alicia Garza, and yes, that is one of them. So, congratulations on that one. Um, Alicia Garza actually is credited with inspiring the slogan when, after the July 13th acquittal of George Zimmerman um, of his murder of the death of Trevon Martin, she posted on her Facebook page. I continue to be surprised at how little Black Lives Matter. Our lives matter. The second person, who is Patrice Couliar, uh, went on to share that post with a hashtag of Black Lives Matter. And this is sort of where the movement started. Um, I know folks that look like you had Opal Tementi. She is actually the third co-founder, but does not identify as queer. And uh, we threw uh, Janaea Khan in there um, to kind of try to trick folks up. But she is actually a social activist in Canada, and she is the co-founder of the Black Lives Matter Toronto, uh, which is, and she's also an international ambassador for the Black Lives Matter Network and happens to be the wife of Patrice. So all important folks during this movement. Um, this talks a lot about, I think, what we see happened, we've happened, we saw during the civil, uh, civil rights movement with Bayard, Bayard Rustin, but we see our leaders um, taking, you know, the forefront when it comes to issues of human rights and civil rights. So Nick, tell us a little bit about your thoughts on, on um, our leaders in these movements throughout time. I, I, I mean, here's the sad part. We, you and I have had some private discussions about, you know, so many times we don't know this information. You know, we're not taught this information. You know, we can pick, pick up a book, but um, so a lot of times when I go and I speak to clubs throughout the state, organizations, LGBTQ identified, and um, you all can't see it, but in my, my bedroom, I have a uh, picture up of Marsha P. Johnson. And when I first started talking to folks, I'd be like, everybody knows who Marsha P. Johnson is. And I get in rooms and folks were like, who's that? And I'm like, we don't know who Marsha P. Johnson is. We don't know who Sylvia Rivera is. You know, when we, you know, it, I'm so proud. And, and, and let me say this, even when you hear those names, we still leave so many more out of the conversation. Uh, uh, Stormy. De La Reverie, who, who rarely do we talk about uh, a very proud butch uh, woman, black woman who was also pivotal uh, in, in, to the movement at Stonewall. And so, you know, it's so important that we learn about these folks, but what makes me most proud is that almost on any issue when I travel across the state um, and even the country, I don't care what we're talking about, whether it's food insecurity, healthcare, I'm always like, where, where's my tribe? You know, it's LGBTQ folks uh, always at the forefront of those movements, which makes me really proud. And I think really speaks to um, all the intersections. You know, I, I love you all see, I wear my rainbow pin. I, I, I think all the time the rainbow 
flag is such a wonderful um, representation of so many differences coming together, but become one beautiful blend. So, you know, I, I love that people primarily got it right, but the, these are these are these are women we should know about, folks that we should know about. As you said, there's so many throughout history. You know, I mentioned Bayard Rustin. Um, you know. Martin Luther King's right-hand person. He was the one that orchestrated the March on Washington, and he was a proud Black um, gay man activist that we didn't read about in our history books, you know? So again, you know, th those folks that are out there, um, a lot of times it's us as scholars doing our digging and, and finding out these folks and putting them in the forefront. Um, but it also, you know, is up to all of us to to kind of do our own teaching and our own learning, right? So um, thank you for sharing that. We're going to move on to the next. I will say this to you, oh. Bayard, actually, Dr. King says credits Bayard with actually teaching him uh, the primary principles of uh, nonviolent exactly. civil disobedience. Like he's like, Bayard was the expert in this. And yet we, we talk, and of course we want to give due credit to Dr. King, but you know, when Dr. King learns from you, that that says a lot. And Audre Lorde and so many others that that so many times we 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 don't mention. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Absolutely. So here's our third question. Um, this Latinx historical figure was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1996 by President Clinton for their reformation work in the educational system. In 1972. They filed a civil rights lawsuit in the federal courts demanding that New York City provide classroom instruction in transitional Spanish for struggling Latino students. This was considered a major landmark in the history of bilingual education in the United States. In 1961, they founded Aspira, Spanish for Aspire, and it is the only national nonprofit Hispanic organization dedicated exclusively to developing the educational and leadership capacity of Hispanic youth. It works to provide programs that encourage Hispanic students to stay in school, prepare them for success in the educational arena, develop their leadership skills, and to serve their community. Who was this amazing leader? Let's see. Pull up. There it is, our Jeopardy music. I'm going to give you about 20 seconds, folks. This is Final Jeopardy round. <laughs> oh, you got one more round. <laughs> How many people will know this? No using Google or your phone? And that's the end of Final Jeopardy. We're going to put up the results. And wow, look at that. It's a lot of different answers here, but the majority got the right answer. Yes, yes. Antonia Pantojas is the correct answer. Yay. Well, let me, and let me tell you a little bit. All of these folks are important queer Latinx folks or Latino, Latina people um, in our community that have, you know, done some great achievements in their own rights. Monica Maria Marquez, who was the other one that folks thought uh, was the one. She is actually, um, she was born in 1969 as an associate justice of the Colorado Supreme Court. Uh, she's the past president of the Colorado LGBT Bar Association and a board member of the Colorado Hispanic Bar Association. So again, all these folks in their own uh, way have paved the way have paved the way in history for our LGBTQ uh, Latino familia. So one of the things um, that this this question kind of makes me think about is our educational systems and curriculums and how tough they are to change. Yet we saw Antonia pave the way for bilingual education in the U.S. You know this fearless Latina lesbian made it happen. But today we still see so many issues in our educational system. Um, as it pertains to LGBT issues. So I'm going to ask Nick to talk a little bit about your thoughts with that one. So here, here's the interesting thing about this question. My partner, Jasmine, is a teacher, a high school teacher, and also the sponsor of a GSA in Palm Beach County. And I don't think many people are aware in the state of Florida, you can opt out of right now um, learning about Black history. You can opt out of learning about LGBTQ history. 
Uh, in, in fact, my, my partner had the very example where uh, a parent called and was upset uh, when my partner was discussing Harvey Milk. So when you look back and you think this is 1972, you know, that this, this case is filed, that this, this is happening. Um, and yet we're in 2020 and how far have we really come? Um, you know, we're, we're happy about the fact that you cannot opt out of learning about the Holocaust and you should not be able to, but you shouldn't be able to opt out of learning about our country, learning about um, where we come from. History is history. And so when we're not aware, you might think that, you know, we don't need this now, but the truth is we do. We, we, still, we still need to legislate uh, to mandate that these things are taught. I, I don't think those are things you should be able to opt out of, but please know right here in South Florida, you can. Right, right. It's really important, you know, when you think about whose history gets told and who, who's the one that's in power to make those decisions. Um, you know, I oftentimes think about if, you know, our kids today who we still see some of the highest homeless rates and suicide rates uh, on, among our LGBT youth, if they had learned about their history, if they had heard those words spoken in their classroom, you know, would that have changed uh, or saved a life? So how critical it is and, and, and important it is to learn about a history, yet many folks don't do it. They don't, they don't get that opportunity to learn about it. Um, yeah, if, 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 if I could add Dr. Vega, um, even something as far when we think about what's, what's taught in schools, this is why it's so important to pay attention to policy and the law and who sits on our courts because um, this past legislative session, um, right here in the state of Florida, they were trying to pass to mandate that teachers and guidance counselors uh, be required to out students. So to the parents. So if you go tell a teacher or a guidance counselor that you were uh, identified in the community, they would have been under a mandate to tell parents. You know, we, we genuinely think that, I think there's something wrong with that, especially when we have the highest populations of um, youth uh, as it relates to suicide, um, self-harm. So uh, again, I can't, I can't be any more clear that these are the very things we're still working against and why it's so important that we keep this topic on folks' minds and why it's also so important that you vote. Not telling you who to vote for, but it, it's so important because these are the issues that come up. Absolutely, thanks. All right, we're gonna move on to our last question. So the last question is a former member of the Madison, Wisconsin Common Council. This individual was the first openly LGBTQ Latinx elected to public office in the United States. In 1989, they elected to the Madison Common Council representing District 4. Who are they? All right, let's get that Jeopardy music back on. <laughs> this is Final Jeopardy, folks. This is your last chance to bet it all. Results are. Oh, ooh, that was okay. Interesting, interesting. Well, most of you picked Javier Gonzalez, which was a good guess. Um, but actually, Javier Gonzalez is an American politician who served as the 42nd mayor of Santa Fe from 2014 to 2018. He was the city's first openly gay mayor. Um, so Although that was a great guess and the last name may be right, we were actually looking for our answer was Ricardo Gonzalez. Born in 1946 in Cuba, he was an American politician and in 1974 um, became that, you know, the first openly LGBTQ population. Um, you know, as we were thinking about this, uh, you know, we, we looked at the politicians or people in office who identify as Latinos. And while we have many Latinos openly out LGBT, 
um, we still find that that's a pocket that's missing. And given this is one of the largest segments of our population, I find that really interesting. Um, you know, we have a man who was elected 30 years ago to be, you know, an open politician, but yet still we don't have an openly elected LGBTQ Latino Latina in office at the federal court level, at the federal level. Um, so Nick, I want to ask your thoughts about that. I have a lot of thoughts about that. Uh, number one, I agree with you that that's a travesty. That's a shame. We, we clearly, the, the talent is there. Um, but I, I, I have a saying in, in my family, my mom always said, you got to sweep your own house first, right? Before you worry about someone else, look at the state of Florida. Uh, Representative Carlos Guillermo Smith out of Central Florida right now is the only out LGBTQ uh, person representing uh, us in this state. And he is an incredible, incredible advocate uh, for our community. And that's lonely. What, what does that say? And so what we have to do is sort of connect. You don't wake up today and, and run for Congress, right? So you, you've you got to have, you know, the background. You've got to have donors. You've got to know people. Uh, in, in many ways, grassroots is real, but that these races are expensive. It gets a lot harder at a federal level. So if we're thinking about how do we have folks in that pipeline, what are we doing to have folks coming along? So a prime example, and again, I'm not telling you who to vote for, but right there in Miami, you all have Ricky Hunkettle, who is running for House District 118. Ricky's in the race of his life. This is an out LGBTQ uh, man who is an incredible advocate, has been. And so when we talk about representation and the lack thereof, we're the people that have to put them there. And so when someone like Ricky is running to represent South Florida and actually Ricky, one of the things he's running on, he's great on the environment and different things, but Ricky says when he wins, he wants to be the lead sponsor of the Florida Competitive Workforce Act, which would stop all discrimination in the state of Florida against LGBTQ people. Uh, we, we, we all know about the Boston case, but what about accommodations? You still can be, uh, denied accommodations, housing, et cetera, in the state of Florida. And so when we understand, how do you set a Carlos up, a Ricky up, is you've got to get them to statewide office and hope, hopefully then elevate them to be able to run for that federal office. But we've got to do better identifying those folks. And then when they run, we've got to do better supporting them. Absolutely, absolutely. According to the Williams Institute, you know, there's 13 million LGBT people in the US over the age of 13. And if we break it down into our black community and our Latino community, we've got what about 3.7% that identify as LGBTQ in the black community. And I think it's about 4.3% in the Latino community. So if we think about those, you know, um, and we think of that larger number, we need to get people to come out obviously for their community, but also to work collaboratively, co collaboratively and build coalitions and make sure that, you know, we are unifying our voices to create, create change, right? That's, that seems to be a big uh, piece of this as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, just to share a little bit too, um, there were two other people we had on this last question that I did want to share a little bit of information about. Eric uh, Fidelis Alva was a staff sergeant in the Marines. He was actually the first Marine seriously injured in uh, the Iraq war who lost his, his right leg. Um, the interesting thing with him besides his, you know, his commitment and his service uh, was he became a spokesperson for the HRC when uh, the legislation, um, they, they were going through the process of repealing the don't ask, don't tell policy that um, you know, it was introduced um, regarding service men and women in the armed forces. And so he was one of those folks that spoke out and said, look, I served my country. What do you mean, don't ask, don't tell? This is who I am. This is my life. I practically gave my life for it. You know? um, so he, he's one of those you know, LGBT Latinos who's, uh, who was out there making change in our community. And then the other one, uh, Martin Farca Colton, uh, is an American computer scientist of Argentinian descent, whose work um, 
is known for their work with uh, streaming algorithms. They're currently, a, they were a professor at Rutgers University and they co-founded a storage technology startup company called Tukotech. So again, you know, people we don't hear about, these are our unsung heroes that are in our community. And, you know, we need to do a better job of telling our story and getting our story out there. Anything else you want to add there, Nick? You you said it best. Uh, again, I just go back to it's 2020. And, and right now, what we know for sure is that we need our, our voices in spaces. Representation matters. We need to see ourselves. So uh, when we talk about a Carlos, we're, we're lucky uh, that hopefully uh, after November 3rd, we may have the largest uh, equality caucus ever in the state of Florida. You know, Michelle Rayner out of Central Florida, who will be joining the House of Representatives, is running uncontested. Uh, Chevron Jones, who will probably end up being the first uh, black out uh, senator in the state of Florida. Um, Ricky Junquero, who if he makes it out of Miami, uh, will be just the second um, state representative uh, LGBTQ identified Latinx member uh, in the state of Florida. You know, the, these are folks, Joshua Hicks out of Jacksonville. We have um, some really talented folks. And so how do we make it easier and safer for these folks to run? Um, I just wanna add, and, and I'm careful because, you know, I'm not, I'm, I speak very much about my community and my experience, but I had the opportunity to sit down with Ricky and he said, you know, I take heat from both sides because I have folks saying, why aren't you running with the rainbow? And he goes, it's hard for me to do that. You know, in my Latin communities, you know, people have been accepting, but it also can't be front and center that I'm an out candidate. And so until we have real conversations about some of the barriers that these folks uh, experience and we have tough, difficult conversations within our own communities, it's gonna be hard to, to change that fact and it, it needs to change. We need to have representation from our Latinx community at all levels. Absolutely. It's almost like that's our next series segment, right? Nick, you will get, well, Nick, we'll get together. We'll do it. Our next series segment on how absolutely. do we create that change and how do we build these collaborations? Because you're absolutely right. Um, in the Latino community, we still face a lot of issues when it comes to issues of gender and sexuality. Um, and while it's changed somewhat, um, there's still some real, real issues um, that have to be overcome within our communities. I'm sure as well as in the Black community. You absolutely. Know, we meet with students every day. Um, who are telling me, you know, because of my my background, my upbringing, my identities, my family won't accept me. So these are still real things that are happening today. Thank you, Nick. Um, I think at this time we're going to turn it back over to Roberto to open up for questions. Thanks, Dr. Vega and Nick. Uh, yeah, we have a couple of questions here, and I think I'm going to start with this one. Um, Nick, you've touched uh, on this a little bit. Um, are there specific actions or practices that we can incorporate you know, into our daily lives so that we can help um, the entire community, not just the LGBTQ community, better understand uh, our history? I think you mentioned voting was you know, a big thing that we could do to help pass a couple of uh, rules on you know, teaching this kind of history. For sure, um, understanding that it's not a requirement and um, that you could opt out. I mean, that that's a legislative action that, you know, we theoretically could get passed quickly. Um, passing the Competitive uh, Workforce Act in the state of Florida the um, and the Equality Act at a federal level. I talk so much about voting because right now we're in the middle of election. Uh, again, not telling you who you're gonna vote for, but understanding these are the issues that are on the ballot. So when we talk about number one, you're, you're right, Roberto, I would tell anybody right now, vote, 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 and take other people to vote with you and make yourself, um, educate yourself on the issues. And if you don't know, reach out to folks who have done that work to um, educate on the issues that may be important to you. Um, we just celebrated, what, last week, National Coming Out Day. Uh, I think about that, and I always tell people, let's be careful. It's not safe for everybody to come out. But for the folks, it's safe to come out uh, that it is. It's important that we come out. I, I love that when I came out, you know, I always share a story. My parents were, I don't want to say super homophobic, but it was nothing to hear um, 
homophobic language slurs in my household growing up until my parents faced their own daughter coming out. And now my parents are incredible allies. Um, I, I have to quickly share the story. My mom jumped on phone banking the other night with the human rights campaign and we're going around and my mom who's almost 70 years old is like, so my pronouns are she, her. I want to make sure. And I was like, I, I, I teared up because I was like, how far my own family have come, but that was because I came out, because I'm visible, because I'm so um, public about who I am and how I identify, you know, showing up in a suit and tie is how I usually dress. Uh, I was a kid who contemplated suicide because I didn't see myself, because I grew up, uh, my grandfather was a pastor, my uncles were pastors. I kept saying, if I made it out of that space, I would be what I didn't see. So I think it's important for us to own all of our identities and spaces, to have difficult conversations, to vote at all levels. There's so much that we can do in our own communities to help change this. Absolutely. And, you know, Nick, you talk about the, the voting, right? And, and speaking up and getting involved. Actually, it was in 2011. And there are states that have done this, right? California passed their uh, Fair Education Act that mandated that LGBTQ um, history be taught in social study classrooms, you know, and be age appropriate. So states are doing it, but again, it takes people to sort of make their voices heard and to get out there and vote and, and make changes in policies. Common sense ain't common. That should be common sense that it's taught. I tell people common sense ain't common. And so how do you change that? I would love to tell you it's just going down to your school to complain. It's not. It's got to be changed at a legislative level. And so um, if you just indulge this quick moment is that how is it the Florida Competitive Workforce Act in the state of Florida? Right now, you can look it up as the most popular bill every year, yet it can't get a hearing. And so even if it got a hearing and passed, you've got to have a governor that's going to sign it. You can make that difference right now. The Equality Act. It won't pass if it can it got out of the house, it has to pass the Senate. And then it has to get to a president's desk that's gonna sign it. You know, again, regardless of what side of the aisle you're on, you know, I, I think we have to be careful when we politicize, you know, common sense and people's rights and freedoms. That that's not that shouldn't be a political issue to me, but it is. And so if it is, then we've got to put the right folks in there that are gonna make sure that we have rights and protections and freedom like everybody else. Great. Um, okay, so I guess this is a nice segue. So education's, um, you know, a common thread, awareness um, throughout all of this. Um, so for folks on, on the call today, you know, where would you recommend that they uh, start educating themselves uh, about this history? Uh, Dr. Vega, perhaps, do you have any resources you could recommend? Absolutely. You know, with the internet out there and the World Wide Web, there's so much information out there. You can actually go to uh, lgbthistorymonth.org, I believe it is, and they have a ton, a ton of history and important figures throughout the time that they showcase every year for History Month. I think the other thing is to check your local colleges and universities and see, do they offer courses? Um, you know, do they offer courses as part of their um, adult learning programs or their returning programs? Those are always there. And then the other thing is, you know, there are some great books that have been written about the LGBT history. Um, many of them I use in my classrooms. There's Out of the Past by Neil Miller. Um, there's um, one book that's amazing to learn about gender and sexuality is by the author Anna Fosso Sterling, um, Sexing the Body. You know, there's a lot of great, great books that are there. People just got to kind of be intentional about looking for them and seeing where they're at. Um, and if anybody's looking for some free books, we actually had a bunch of LGBT books donated to the center. Um, we've been giving some of them away. So if you want to pick up a free book, come visit us at the LGBTQ Student Center. We've got some to, to give out. But those are, those are some of the places that I would suggest starting. Uh, Dr. Vega, if I could piggyback off of that, um, I, I assume everybody's very learned on this call, but uh, we live in a television age as well. You know, get on Netflix, get, look up uh, James Baldwin's I Am Not Your Negro, look up uh, The Life and Death of Marsha P. Johnson, um, get on and look at Paris is Burning. These are things, you know, there's so many different things, different ways we can we can do it. But uh, that that's easy if you're laying home and, and maybe want to watch a little TV. 
Yeah, actually, you reminded me that PBS had a great series um, before and after Stonewall. It's like a four part series tells you all about our history, uh, what we've missed and how we've been kind of excluded. So make sure to check that out as well. And then, um, you know, art imitates life or life imitates art. I don't know how that works both ways, but for those of you that want to take a look into the, the Black culture and the Latino culture um, and our history, particularly around the area 80s, Pose, if you haven't seen it, you know, it's amazing. Pose has been the first largest trans um, inclusive cast uh, series that's been put out there and it's you know it's gotten great awards and it's it's just amazing you know and, and our we have a rich history and again I know the for this particular section was talking about our unsung heroes um, there are some great movies out there um, actually if you're not familiar with the outshine film festival which is Florida's LGBT film festival happens twice a year in Fort Lauderdale and in Miami they have amazing movies that talk about you know, important history, um, things that we may not necessarily get to hear about. Great, thanks Dr. Vega. And thanks uh, to my colleague, Andrew, for that question. Um, let me get a little more, more personal. So in your opinion, you know, who were the most uh, influential people of color um, in the movement and you know, who influenced you um, specifically? Uh, maybe uh, Nick, I wanna start with you. I think you mentioned a little bit of the Motown uh, era that was pretty influential for you? I, I'm going to actually, I, I need a minute on this one. Dr. <laughs> Vega, you ready? I got I got so many folks. I got to think. I, that. I am kind of ready. And I guess I, you could say I kind of cheated because I used it as my uh, one of the questions. Antonia Pantojas is somebody um, being a Latina of Panamanian and Puerto Rican descent. Um, she She was kind of a role model for me. And Although she wasn't publicly out there as a lesbian, obviously in education um, during the time where she was making these incredible changes, it wasn't wasn't possible to be out um, and open, particularly you know working in education. But she had a lifelong uh, partner and spouse that she lived with, and after she wrote her um, 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 biography or autobiography, she actually came out then. Um, and to me, again, this is somebody who. Um, changed education, right? Changed the way that U.S. education um, kind of looked at the most marginalized among them, right? At Latino kids um, who, you know, didn't have a good command of the language and, and created a, a pathway for them to learn. So Antonia Pantojas is somebody that I would, I, I you know, automatically gravitate to for many reasons. Um, and then the other person I, I would say for me has been Bayard Rustin, just reading his story, knowing that he did learn from Gandhi directly the nonviolent path, you know, and brought that to our civil rights movement. I mean, that that's not the stories that you're hearing about. Um, so those two were, were really influential in me and, 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 you know, people that I tend to look up to. So I'm going to piggyback off of that. Bayard Rustin for me is definitely one. Uh, this question was hard because I, there are so many folks that I look up to that inspire me um, ac across the country. You got Kim Jackson running in Atlanta. You've got um, Dallas Harris out in Nevada, who is in the House of Rep Representatives and, and looks like me in the sense of, you know, masculine identity, masculine center. Um, woman and these folks are running when you look at all of our um trans folks who are running for office and winning danica rome i look across the country and i'm so incredibly proud you know to see folks that come from traditionally marginalized communities um, making their voices heard and known all of that inspires me so um I, I had to cheat and kind of put them all together and say they all inspire me and then of course my parents yes. you know we, we have to look to our our own spaces if we're lucky enough to have that um i i am my parents uh definitely laid that foundation in me and you know took our family to the middle class and what that meant they're hard-working folks and i i look up to them all the time well, thank you both for sharing some of that. Uh, we've got one more question. Um, you know, what are the challenges that people of color face in the LGBTQ community? And I'm going to add to that um, if you can give one piece of advice, um, you know, to the young people on the call today and uh, to my colleagues, um, 
that helps them understand, you know, those challenges, what would it be? Ooh. There's a lot there. <laughs> um, Nick, you want to start on this one? Truthfully, that, that is hard. I, I don't know what challenges you won't face. I mean, let, let's be real. I think about the challenges women face already. Then I had being a black woman and then have the audacity to show up, you know, masculine, a center in a suit and tie. Um, what I could tell you is um, don't worry about it. I mean, th that's the truth. Folks are gonna, gonna come after you. Uh, we make jokes in, the, in, in communities. If you don't have uh, 10 haters by the, you know, right now have 10 more by the end of the year. People are always gonna throw stuff at you um, is standing strong in who you are and knowing that, you know, you stand on someone's shoulders and someone's going to stand on your shoulders. So have a great support system that encourages you. Folks can be mean sometimes, but there are also some wonderful people there to support you. I, I freely give out my information. Um, so have a great support system, but no, um, folks don't like different. <laughs> Many times folks don't like change. And that's their problem. That's their problem. And so keep being you and um, find the people that love and support you and pour into you. Yeah, I, I think for me, I think some of the challenges are gateways to education still. When we look at, you know, 23% of LGBT African Americans uh, adults have a college education and only about 15% of LGBT Latino adults have an education. And we know that education tends to be sort of that equalizer when you look at jobs and employment and things like that. Um, so for me, it's starting with the education piece, right? Uh, opening doors, making sure that um, we provide opportunities. Um, one of the hats I wear as I sit with our Point Foundation, which is the National LGBT Scholarship uh, Program. And you know, the, our communities, our black and brown and Latinx communities, um, we're, not, we're not leveled on that playing field when it comes to education yet. You know, just like we're not leveled on the playing field when you look at politics. So we need to find ways to create segues, doorways, pathways um, for our LGBT folk, brown, you know, black, brown and, and Latinx to be able to, to get those, those uh, educational opportunities opened. Um, Unemployment is still 15% for LGBT African Americans, you know, and when you look at Latinos, uh, Latino LGBT, it's about 11%. So again, creating spaces, opportunities, um, educating, um, and finding support, financial supports, things like that. Those are, those are all important. And I did mention something earlier. There is still a lot of stigma and misunderstanding within our communities about what it means to be LGBTQ. If I had, you know, a dollar for every student that came to my office that said, oh, my parents found out about my identity and I'm Jamaican or I'm black or I'm Latino and they've kicked me out, um, I'd be rich. You know, I want to be put out of my job. I, I don't want to be at, there to do that. But unfortunately, that's that's the reality of where we're at with our communities of color um, who may have sexualities or gender identities uh, than different from their families. You know, it's it's a, it's it's creating education and awareness. That's that's a big piece, um, and working with these families to do that. So, there's actually a great program called. Um, um, oh my gosh, it just escaped my mind. Um, uh, where they return, the focus is on returning um, uh, Lati Latinx or Latino LGBT kids to their home. Um, I'll find that program and I'll, I'll be sure and share it with the group um, so that we can get it out to everybody. I'll just say this, when you're at that table, make space for other folks that look like us. I'll pull more folks in for folks that are already at those tables. It looks like inviting someone that looks like me here to chat. So I thank you all for that. But again, when you get somewhere, bring somebody else with you and find a mentor. Find find somebody, if you like what they're doing, ask them what they're doing and get them to work with you. Yep. Great. So I think uh, those are all the questions that we had up. Dr. Vega, over to you. Thank you. All right. So um, we wanted to take a minute um, 
And again, thank Roberto, Kevin, and Nick for joining us today and being here with this webinar. We hope you all learned a little bit about LGBTQ history. And uh, if, if you haven't, hopefully we um, you know, influenced you to go ahead and want to learn about it. Um, wanted to just remind you all that if you're not part of the LGBTQ Student Center Pride Press newsletter that comes out weekly, please subscribe to it. Um, we'll share that link with all of you so that you're able to do that. And I'll also remind you to follow us on social medias. We are on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, we have our own YouTube channel. And our uh, something we're doing really exciting this month is we have our 21 day anti-racism LGBTQ challenge. So you can join it at any time. We have a challenge every day. We hope you'll take it. And uh, please remember that we're there for you if there's anything we can ever do to assist you in our community. The last thing I'll share is to please remember that there is a survey after this event to take a minute to complete it. We would love to hear your feedback. Um, let us know what we can do to continue to you know, enhance these webinars for you. And um, it's been my pleasure being here. Roberto, back to you. Sorry, everyone, having a little technical difficulties. Well, thank you, Dr. Vega and Nick, and of course, Kevin, for your time. Um, I'd say to say that, you know, I've learned a lot about uh, people that I didn't really learn about in school, and I have a greater appreciation for those uh, unsung heroes of the LGBTQ plus movement. Um, so we hope that all of you at home, you know, took something away from this and that uh, you'll join us for our next programs. Thank you.